Marketer of the day, number 471. Optimize conversions, get the word out, and talk to your customers to find objections, ideas, and clients with merchant account wizard, Dr. Glenn Livingston. Hey everyone, and we're so glad you're listening with us today. We're talking with Dr. Glenn Livingston, and he's a clinical psychologist, and he was the longtime CEO of two major dollar consulting firms, which have sold more than $30 million in services to Fortune 500 companies like Kraft, Nabisco, and a bunch of others. And you may have seen or heard his work, his research, or his theories in major periodicals like the New York Times, Crane's New York Business, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Sun Times, and so many more. And in recent years, Dr. Glenn Livingston built and sold a 21 person online advertising agency, and he turned to teaching small businesses to leverage the tools and techniques used by big industry. So I don't know about you, but I'm super excited to jump in and hear about all those missing opportunities we have out there. So how are things with you, Glenn? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Fantastic. Well, same here. So, I mean, let's just jump right in. What, what's the low-hanging fruit? What do people need to know about? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, late, lately I wound up in a very weird niche where I find that um, there are certain parts of business where there's a lot of bloat that people ignore because it's seemingly on small amounts, but it's, it's actually um, involved with every transaction. And I recently realized that I, I'd put $5 million through, um, through just a standard merchant account. And if I had just taken five minutes to, you know, shop around a little bit and have it evaluated and match up an account with the appropriate risk-taking undertake, um, undertaker, un, underwriter. I'm a little under the weather today, so I sound a little funny. That, um, you know, I, I could have I could have saved between like thirty and fifty thousand dollars over the years. That would have been in my pocket instead of theirs. And more importantly, there's all this stuff happening in the um, money moving industry that people don't think about where when you manage to engineer a growth spurt in your business, um, all of a sudden the merchant account doesn't really want to work with you. And then you're stuck for a couple of months without being able to process. And it's uh, something that most entrepreneurs don't believe is going to happen until it happens to them because the majority of the industry, of the underwriting industry really likes to, you know, work with the smaller entrepreneurs that do between 10 and 40 grand a month. They don't like to take the risks on the bigger entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there. There's also low-hanging fruit in terms of conversion optimization for people's websites. But um, lately we've been talking more about the, like, very, very quick win, easy to pick up, um, money that saves, you know, puts money in your account as opposed to the banker's account on an ongoing basis. Oh, yeah. So, so what's the lesson to be learned there or what's the action to be taken there? Like, should people, should they just like pick up the phone and, and call a merchant account or find a coach? Or how do people apply that sort of thinking that you mentioned where there's, you know, they're, they're wasting money every single month on something, maybe because they're not the right fit or maybe they need to shop around. So what should people be doing? Well, what, one thing you can do is call your merchant account and tell them that you are going to be shopping around and ask them if they can beat the rates in any way. Um, that, that is a possibility. Um, I actually have a little service at merchantaccountwizard.com where we, you know, we'll set up a free analysis and compare and contrast for you. But, um, yeah, you, you should be doing that. You should be connecting with your account and asking them how much volume you're going to be permitted to do. Um, you should ask them what happens if you suddenly go over that volume. You should make sure that you let them know if you're going to be go over that volume. You should tell them that you're working hard on your customer service department and we don't know if they have any tips or articles for you. Not because they're necessarily going to give that to you, but because they're going to really like hearing that because their their biggest fear is that you're going to disappear in your customers. Because let's say you have a month and you've been doing 20 grand and all of a sudden you do 200 grand and it explodes your customer service department and they have a whole bunch of angry customers that say, hey, you know, we need our money back because this guy won't refund us or he won't deliver and um, no, I can't get in contact with anybody or I don't like the way they're treating me. And then all of a sudden the merchant account is on the hook for that, for that money. So if you tell them that you are you know, working on your customer service department, you want to know if they have any tips, they're going to make a little note in the file that this is, this is a good company. Um, and if you talk to them about you know, the rates and ask them if they could review things and can they do any better, that, that'll often help too. But um, 
You know, I, I, I have a friend who was doing almost a half a million dollars a month and got shut down all of a sudden because um, it was no fault of his own. He was selling to mentally to the families of people with serious mental health diagnoses. And sometimes the people themselves would get a hold of the book and be angry. And so they would call and charge back. And all of a sudden, he couldn't process $500,000 a month. And it took him seven months to get off the blacklist and be able to get his business up and running again and you know, lose millions of dollars in the process. So, so he spent he spent a year or so thoroughly researching and making connections in the industry and um, developed some good relationships with some very not only well-priced underwriters, but underwriters who really understand that a business is looking for a growth strategy. Like even though there's lower risk for the underwriter to just deal with a business that stays the same all the time, um, a business really wants to engineer a you know a, a boom. You're really, really looking to engineer that sales funnel that um, you know 10x is your business, but you can't do that if the merchant account doesn't understand. So you know he can connect you with some people that are right for your type of industry and blah, blah, blah. So um, we're happy to help you with that or you can just make the calls yourself. Okay, great. So just to make sure I have the link right. So merchantaccountwizard.com is the place for people to yeah. reach out and, and deal with you and your team. So that way they're not just trying this themselves. Yeah, exactly. All right, great. And so and what I'm hearing from you in general is is basically like be a real business, right? Don't be a hobby business and be proactive. So if you if you know that you have a big launch coming up, you know you're going to have a big increase in volume, then let that merchant account know. And, and it sounds like people should just be calling the merchant account regardless, right? Like they won't be they won't be irritated or annoyed. They'll be happy to hear from you, right? They'll be happy to hear from you. It would be good for you to have um, a couple of names there of people you can ask for and talk to, so that if there ever is a problem, they you know recognize that this is a guy who's in touch and wants to take care of things. Um, you know, and and um, and if you are going to do a launch, make sure that you do beef up your customer service as well, because it it really is quite a different story to you know the mi the minor problems that you deal with at X volume become major problems when you're at 10 times X. So try to think through what the customer service issues are going to be and have some trainings and you know even look up online how to improve your customer service and have somebody mystery shop your phone number and see how everybody's dealing with it. And just a, a couple little things like that can prevent nightmares later on. And they can also increase sales, by the way, because most people don't think of a, most people don't think of, of customer service as a sales enhancement opportunity, but a lot of times, angry customers with problem solves become your best customers going forward. You can often upsell them right there on the spot. Um, so this is not, a lot of people ignore their customer service because they feel like they have to concentrate on sales, but there's actually, um, there's actually increased sales available inside of your customer service department um, if you think about it the right way. Well, great. And I mean, what's, I mean, would you say that there are like different, different sorts of tiers as far as like, you know, or like levels as far as people beefing up their customer service? Cause I mean, for example, like for years and years I made the mistake, well, I don't know if it's a mistake, but I, I had the problem of, I was dealing with support via email, just me and my business partner. And then we had uh, one of these launches where we made 3000 sales in a day. And suddenly we had to move things over to a help desk and then it, me and him were handling it themselves. And that was a nice, it's sort of smooth transition. We weren't totally, you know, making things super crazy, but then even that became too much. And we had to have someone jump in. And then there have been times when we've thought about from the customer support side of things. Uh, sometimes we call people occasionally, but we thought about, you know, making it what we call everyone or have someone call everyone or have a whole sequence. Or we've discussed things like having, giving people the ability to call in on the phone. So, I mean, would you say like, are there like two or three or four different like levels of, of customer support? Would you say like someone could maybe identify like what notch they were in and, and move up? Any sort of ideas or thoughts like that? Well, I think you just laid out the ladder for them. I think that's, um, that is absolutely true and it's a fabulous ascension model to, to consider. Um, you know, and there, there's also taking the time to get to know your help desk software because there's all types of macros and routing systems and you can have, you can have certain types of emails forwarded to you and other ones are handled by your customer service people. And then you can start to measure response time and satisfaction and 
um, we use Zendesk. I don't know what you use as a as a help desk, but um, there are all sorts of ways that you can you can improve that. Um, the the biggest problems that I see are people that are at those lower levels and just haven't thought it through at all, and all of a sudden get those you know three thousand sales and things just blow up and they can't do it. Um, but I absolutely agree with you, Robert, and I. I don't know if I can do a better job than you at laying out what you what you said. All right. Well, well, fair enough. Well, something that you mentioned, like you mentioned a couple times, that maybe some business owners. <laughs> Uh, oh, bless you. Some business owners, maybe they don't see this customer support thing or dealing with people. They don't see it as a priority or they look at it as maybe like a chore or something they have to do. And you're a psychologist. So do you have any tricks or, or techniques to make this a priority? Should it just be like something on the checklist? Should we set aside time for it? I mean, how, how do you get yourself, I guess, motivated enough to, to even focus on this part of your business? Well, Twice a week, I monitor the customer service portion of my business myself. So for you know two hours on Mondays and Fridays, I have the tickets coming into me. I look at them. Um, I don't respond to them all necessarily, but I'm looking at them directly just to be immersed in that. Um, and I will call at least one customer on both of those um, both of those days just to make sure that I'm always actually talking to customers and I remember you know what they sound like, feel like, and smell like. Um, and it's actually some of the most exciting work that I do. You might think of it as as demeaning, but um, it really keeps me in touch with the market. I, I'm amazed at how many, especially online entrepreneurs that I meet, who really want to hide behind their computers and move electrons around and have them wind up in their bank account with this fantasy that you, know, you don't ever have to deal with a real person. But when I when I coach people and I get them to actually talk to the customers. Nobody, nobody's ever come back and said that was a waste of time. Nobody has ever come back and said, I you know, I wish you didn't make me do that. It's always it's always valuable. There's always some insight. There's always some sales objection that you hadn't thought up with or there's there's always some reason that people actually purchased that you didn't think would be a reason that they purchased. And then you can feed that back to them in the marketing and enhance your sales. So um, I would say to make a regular time once or twice a week when you monitor the customer service system yourself, even if you're the CEO, and um, that you get on the phone with the customer at least once or twice a week. And that's super great. And uh, and I love, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons to do that, like you said, and I love that last one you had in there, if I'm understanding you right, where you, you reach out and you handle so, a little bit of the customer service yourself and talk to people to figure out maybe what motivated them to buy or what objections made them not buy and things like that. So that way you can pick up on their language and then use it again in your webinars, your emails, your web pages, and all your marketing. Is that right? Yeah, and you can also ask them what frustrations they encountered as they were looking for a solution. Um, you can ask them, did they consider any of the competitors? Why did they purchase or not purchase from them? Um, what is it that is not available in the market that they wish was available? There's so what, what tends to happen in a market is what I would call marketing incest, where every vendor copies all the other vendors. But you really shouldn't be copying the other vendors. I mean, you can to a certain extent if you have proven evidence of success. But you should be asking the consumers what they want and where, where are the unmet needs and market gaps. And it's, it's only really by talking to the customers that you can get that. You can't get it by just looking at what your competitors are doing. Right. Um, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and so um, – so you mentioned that so we need to be picking up the phone and calling our, our customers and you mentioned also that you provide this sort of coaching so I'm sure that maybe you you dealt with some coaching clients who were either afraid of making these calls or were resistant did you come across any of that it's the hardest thing I get people to do <laughs> so how do we do it I, I, I came to um, I came to fame by, I, I had a marketing research formula, which I used to do all this multi-million dollar consulting. And then I applied it to individual niches and I built all these electronic funnels and I was making a bunch of money. And then I was going around talking about it. And so I, I came to fame in the marketing world as you know a guy who could help you set up these electronic funnels. So I, I kind of wish I never did that because I attracted all these people that want to hide behind their screen. Um, I tell people, look, you have to know what your customer, smell, customer smells like. You're not going to find that out by looking in forums and, you know, reading surveys. You're 
at some point going to actually have to get out and talk to them. I would prefer that you went to a trade conference. I would prefer that you spent a day in the field going on service calls or, um, you know, actually meeting these people and getting some real memories in your mind. But thank God they have things like telephone and Skype these days and you can arrange to, you know, get on the phone and talk to them and, you know, pretend, pretend like you're talking to a girl you really wanted to date or pretend like you're um, hanging out with an uncle you really enjoy hanging out with and just, just grin and bear it. Just do it. It's, it's, um, it's going to be a good thing. Good things always come when you connect with your customers. Well, great. And what, and what I'm hearing from both this and our conversation a few minutes ago about calling your merchant account, it, it seems like, uh, I don't know, just the way that, like the scenario you're laying out, the way that you're explaining this, it's, it seems like maybe a huge problem is that we think that by reaching out to people, we're going to be annoying them. And, and maybe they're annoyed that we're not reaching out enough. Is that yeah. on the right track? Yeah. Yeah. And it goes along with the same thing where people are afraid to market. Um, where they feel like maybe it's unethical or they feel like an icky used car salesman. But I think you, if you have something that genuinely improves people's lives, it's actually more unethical not to market it than to market it. Um, I mean, the ultimate example would be like if you had the cure for cancer, you got to get the word out, right? Um, but maybe we don't have the cure for cancer, but we have something that for a certain segment of the population, their lives are going to be a lot better if they actually have it. If you don't believe that, then you shouldn't be selling it but I'm assuming people are in business because they've got something that actually improves people's lives, then it's, um, you know, actually there are people suffering because they don't know about it and you got to make sure they know about it. Yeah. And even, even you explain like that, it sounds like maybe there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance out there. or Maybe some business owners are frustrated and angry because they're, they feel like, well, no one knows about me, but at the same time, they're not actually being proactive and getting them, market out there they're just expecting people to magically discover them somehow yeah you can't you can't wait for something to happen you have to make it happen I, I, re I remember when I first started in business and I would sit and check my shopping cart and just press refresh 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 <laughs> and no, nothing happened there were no orders coming in and I said well this is ridiculous I have to make something happen um, and make all, all the money that you'll ever make will come from other people and so if you want to make more money, you have to talk to more people. It's really what it comes down to. Right. I mean, it seems pretty simple when you put it out there like that, right? Who's got my money? So do you have any, as we're beginning to wind down, do you have any just like, I don't know, advice, tips, pointers for getting out of that shell, getting out of that comfort zone and actually reaching out to people? Because I, I imagine that after maybe the first few calls, it gets easier, but then also maybe it could be a problem that maybe people can reach out there for a while, but then let it slide or forget about it and then maybe backslide an old habit. So do you have any advice in these last few minutes of what we need to put in our head so that we're always reaching out? Well, you know, we, we improve what we measure, right? And, and we um, can improve what we can control. So you can't necessarily control people's reactions, but you can, you can control the behavior. So you can control how many customers you talk to every week. You can um, you can control how many customer service calls that you take. And if you put together a little Excel sheet and just chart it and tick it off, that becomes rewarding in and of itself. And let that be the end goal. Let the end goal be just to have made the call, talk to the customer, see what happens from there. Um, you'll find that there are other rewards, but you don't have to use those other rewards to sustain the behavior. Use, the, um, use those metrics in and of themselves to sustain the behavior. Super great. So turn it into, into a game, you check off the boxes, and then you, you see in front of your eyes that the progress is being made and progress of things that you can actually control and, and do yourself. Yes. yes. And I, Robert, I'm sorry if I sound like a frog today. I've got, I've got the flu. Ah, no worries. I mean, I, I'm proud of you for powering through it, right? You could have easily canceled. So, uh, yeah. so, so, I mean, but I won't, I won't uh, put too much trust on your voice for too much longer, just a few more minutes here. So we've covered some of the, this low hanging fruit, some of these like easy opportunities for more money. Number one, call up our merchant account, get a good relationship going with them. I love your tip about asking for tips or articles about customer service. If you're uh, beefing up that customer service department. So that way they, they make that note, that way they know that customer ser service is important to you. And then number two, don't hide behind your computer, reach out to, to people and even if it was a bad experience, figure it out why, what happened, how you dropped the ball, if they didn't buy, figure it out 
what the objections were, why they didn't buy. And even if they, they did buy, well then figure out the reasons for that, see if you can sell them on something else. And then number three, do what you can to get the word out because just sitting at home and waiting and clicking that refresh button, we've all done that, right? We've all checked our stats and our saw like, oh, we got 20 visitors to our site today or maybe chased the wrong number. So we set put a plan in place and we say, well, I know that if I, I talk to more customers, then that's, a step in the right direction. So we make that spreadsheet and check, uh, tick off the boxes. And you mentioned uh, in the beginning there that there are a few things that we can do as far as conversion optimization. So in these last few minutes, is there any just easy quick fixes or things that we should be on the lookout as far as optimizing our conversions like you mentioned? Well, yeah. Um, I like to think about the three Ps, problem, promise, and proof. And it has to be immediately apparent on your site specifically what problem you solve or what audience you solve it for. Um, what's the strongest promise that you can make for that audience and how can you prove that you can do that? Um, and the proof needs to be specific to the promise. So it's not just you have a whole bunch of testimonials, but that those testimonials are very specific to exactly what you're promising you can do. So if you're telling people that the reason that your weight loss program is better than everybody else is because you have you have more of an ability to help people lose weight and keep it off in the long run, then you need a bunch of testimonials from people that aren't just saying that your program has greatly lost a bunch of weight, but you need some testimonials from people that are long-term, um, you know, long-term success. And if you're, if the problem you're advertising to is that you're, is very specific to, um, you know, we, we help people who've been diagnosed with diabetes to lose weight and keep it off in the long term so that they can reduce their A1C and, you know, get off of their insulin, then you need testimonials to that effect. And what I find online is that people are not specific enough about the audience that they're targeting. They're not strong enough in the promise that they're making, and they don't take enough time, enough time to very specifically prove that promise. They might get, they might have some proof on the site, but it's not very specific to that unique selling proposition. And if you get the problem, promise, and proof aligned, and the offer is anywhere within reason, then you should be making more sales. And that's super great, and I love that. And I've never heard it explained uh, quite that way because like, I think we've all heard about, you know, like uh, problem, agitate, solve, things like that, but that's, that's super awesome as far as, well, first of all, have the strongest promise that, that you can, and then also having the proof, the testimonials, whatever else it is, reinforce that promise. I mean, I'm guilty of that for sure. I, I make that mistake all the time of just tossing in whatever testimonials are there and not making sure that they're the ones that specifically address that that exact promise. I mean, that, that's huge right there. And I hope that everyone got that, that it's not just it's not just problem promise proof, but it's the promise is strong and the proof is specific to that promise. Yeah, and it's, it's very important because especially online where trust is such a big issue and everybody's skeptical, um, the best definition of hype that I've ever heard is a promise without proof. So if you're making a promise to a specific audience and you can't prove it with specificity, then you're guilty of hype and you lose the customer. Awesome. I mean, super amazing and very clear right there. So, uh, so yeah, so lots of good things for us to, to keep in mind and go back at our own processes and go back and look at our websites and fine tune and, and make some of these, these tweaks. And what's great about all this stuff is these, these are easily doable and, and tweaks, but they're not gimmick sort of tweaks. They're kind of tweaks on the, on the foundation or on the strategy. So this is super great stuff. And I want to make sure, uh, and, uh, uh, and even with your, your voice kind of, um, you know, not good today, but I want to make sure that you tell us all about you and all about your websites and what should we check out after listening to our conversation today? Well, I really would like everyone to look at merchantaccountwizard.com and just, just get a free rate analysis to see what we can do for you and how we can not only put money back into your pocket, uh, with, with no charge to you, by the way, if we can't do that, and um, not only put money back in your pocket, but create a solid expansion and growth strategy for you so you can be secure that when you engineer that next 10x jump that you can actually sustain it. Um, so that's at merchantaccountwizard.com. Th there are other projects and things that I do. I've, I've got a blog at glennlivingston.com if you want to find out more about me and what I can teach and all of my marketing research protocols. And um, I actually also wrote a best-selling weight loss book, and which is largely what I focus on these days. I've got a whole coaching network at neverbingeagain.com. Um, 
But um, yeah, head over to merchantaccountwizard.com and you know, uh, sign up for free rate analysis. Talk to our people, and we will um, we'll get it done for you. And if we can't help them, there's no charge whatsoever. Super fantastic. I love it. Sounds like a great offer, a very generous. So everyone, make sure that you don't forget that web address. Right, if you're driving, pull over, write it down. If you're at the computer, pull it up right now. That's merchantaccountwizard.com and claim that free rate analysis so that Glenn and his team can show you and tell you where those missing opportunities are in your business, how you can make more money just doing the same things that you're doing. So that way, you make more money, you can put that money into further growing your business and exploring all those other opportunities that you know you wanted but never quite had time for. So merchantaccountwizard.com is the place to go. And then like Glenn said, if you're curious about the other things he's got going on, such as his books and things like that, his official site is glennlivingston.com. That's Glenn with two N's. And then neverbingeagain.com is his book. So thanks for stopping by, Glenn. And thanks for powering through with the the um, you know the, the flu situation that you have going on and telling us what we need to know about uh, how to optimize our conversions, how to get that relationship going with our merchant account, how to have better relationships with our customers, and all these things that aren't super time-consuming, aren't super radical. We don't have to throw away our whole business and start something new. We can just use these things to further amplify what we have going on. And this is all great advice, all things that we need to be doing, or even if we think we have a handle on this, go through and just make sure that we have our customer support down, that we have our problem promise proof on our sales letters down, that we're paying the best rate that we can be paying on our merchant account, and that we have these things in place and we did it ahead of time so that way when we do a big launch or have a huge boost or a huge increase in income we don't lose that merchant account or we don't have to go through the painful process of going through many many months of getting back up and running because we followed some of dr glenn's advice and did it ahead of time before it was a problem so merchantaccountwizard.com we'll see you there and thanks so much glenn for stopping by and sharing some of this great advice with us today okay thank you so much have you had a chance to rate and review the show yet if not, go right now to marketeroftheday.com slash iTunes. Click view in iTunes and click the ratings tab. We would really appreciate a five-star rating or whatever you think is fair, plus a quick one-sentence review to tell us how we're doing. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.